<laughs> no, I am good to go. Welcome to the Ada Lovelace Society, in which women who like Ada Lovelace play a leading role in science, technology, engineering or mathematics talk about their outstanding work. Ada Lovelace was a 19th century mathematician from England, known as a pioneer of the digital revolution. She designed a computer program that resembles an algorithm as we know it today. She foresaw the potential of the computer beyond doing calculations, which made her the first official computer programmer. At Ada Lovelace Society, Felix Meritus asks female pioneers of today what they've accomplished and more importantly, what we can learn from them. Hello everyone, my name is Chris Kubeka and I'm the CEO of Hypasec, named after Hypatia. And I'm also the distinguished chair of the Middle Eastern Institute's cyber program. The things I did before this was I am known as an ethical hacker and I uh, studied mathematics, computer science and also uh, at one time aeronautical engineering. And I used to also be in the military in the U.S. Air Force and in the U.S. Air Force Space Command. Well, uh, one of the reasons why it was possible for me to do these things at the age of 10 is because uh, cybersecurity uh, in its form as it is today didn't really exist back then. And uh, although it didn't exist, there were many of the same types of issues, vulnerabilities, and things that you could exploit. And unfortunately, the Department of Justice and the FBI had very, very weak uh, computer systems, either with no password or password of one, two, three, or four. Uh, so it was pretty kind of easy to get in. And it took them a little while to actually figure out that I was in. And uh, they were as surprised as many of you might be right now. Imagine you're an armed agent and you come to a school library and there's a 10-year-old girl with pigtails at a computer system caught red-handed. So um, it was uh, curiosity. It was fun, but I also didn't know the dangers of it. Well, one of the reasons why I was so, say, computer literate at that time was because starting at around the age of five, my mother, who eventually became a robotics programmer for assembly line manufacturing for automobiles, she had put me in front of a computer screen and taught me how to uh, program. And those building blocks of learning some of the earlier computer languages of BASIC, Fortran, and COBOL uh, uh, fed my curiosity about uh, the computer world and the things that you could do with technology, the worlds that you create, the information that you could gain. And so I took that a bit too far when I hacked into those computer systems, uh, driven by innocent uh, curiosity. But uh, that's one of the reasons why I came to that point in time. So it was very interesting what happened afterwards. So the agents uh, came to my school, were not expecting me uh, to be the hacker, and uh, took me down to the local police station to contact my uh, guardians, my grandparents. And uh, they were not too pleased because they both worked at NASA. Uh, and um, this was a bit embarrassing when your kid gets caught doing this kind of thing. So uh, they spoke to the agents. It was determined uh, eventually that I was ordered not to be allowed to use a computer system until the age of 18. And unfortunately, that meant that all of my electronics at that time uh, had to be removed from the house. And I, I was very sad that day when they removed my stuff. And I was very sad the day that they told me I could not use a computer. Uh, for such a long time, because as an eight-year-old, that's almost your entire lifetime. That's 80% of your lifetime to that point in time. Uh, so uh, that, that's what happened, but I still was very, very curious about computer science. So I would still go to the library not touching a computer, I swear. Um, and I would learn about what was going on in computer science, what was going on with uh, then uh, the internet uh, as it was being born. and. The first thing I did the day after I turned 18 was I bought myself a computer system. When I turned 18, 
I uh, decided that I wanted to go to university. And unfortunately, my family did not have the funds to send me to university. Uh, as Unfortunately, as well, the US education system is very, very expensive. When you go to college, it can cost 60,000, 100,000 a year, which is quite a lot of money. And uh, so what I did was I took an entrance exam for the US military. I only missed one question. And then I was recruited by the US Air Force. And they gave me an offer I could not refuse. Uh, the job that they offered was a loadmaster, which, an, which is an air crew member. And I could fly around, I could travel, I could jump out of airplanes. And on the side, the US Air Force knew that I had all of these computer skills. So I also did the security uh, for two flying squadrons. I did very much enjoy being in the uh, Air Force. Uh, I did enjoy flying. And then after I was injured in the line of duty, I then went to Space Command. And I had a new set of challenges of not just securing things on the ground, but securing things in space. So it was quite exciting. And I really, really enjoyed that part of my career. The workday for me, I get up uh, now that it's COVID times, um, take a shower and get in front of my computer and I take a look at interesting things. So I might be asked a question by a journalist to verify if the information they've been given is actually technically correct. Or a journalist might ask me, hey, um, can you look into this uh, leak to uh, see if we can find the same type of leak on a government server or uh, a healthcare center? Or do you have something that is newsworthy for me today? And so I work with a good deal of journalists. Uh, at the same time, I do my own research. So when I see something interesting in the news, then I will go searching myself. Uh, and see what fun I can find or look at something else if I can't find something. And then towards uh, the middle of the day, when the United States wakes up, uh, then I start my duties with the Middle Eastern Institute working on various cyber issues. Uh, most recently, we drafted up on the request of the National Security Council for the White House the uh, Cyber uh, Abraham Peace Accord. Now recently, uh, Israel has normalized a lot of relations uh, with various Arab countries. And they have discussed physical threats, but what we have recently written is those cyber threats. So one country should not surveil another country. Um, one country should not use cyber weaponry or malware against another country. And so I look into those issues and also see if there's been any um, problems between those particular countries or in the Middle East or the Arab world. Recently, one of the things that I found out during my, my morning uh, after my shower uh, was I, a company asked me to look at the overall exposure to medical devices and healthcare related industries uh, since the beginning of COVID, comparing both before COVID, during COVID, and right now. And one of the things that I was able to find and prove is between pharmaceutical companies, research facilities, hospital networks, and medical devices, it has actually increased the amount of items that I can find on the internet. And most of these items are really, really insecure. So I should not be able to find, for example, a ventilator on the internet and be able to play with it and press buttons. Nor should I be able to find um, pharmaceutical companies who are producing the vaccine that we need to get back to normal life. Uh, so many different problems that an everyday hacker who isn't ethical would be able to get into those systems. And so that's one of the things that I found uh, Monday morning. One of the things that I do is I try to be very responsible with the information that I find out. And I try to make sure that it's secure. And uh, then I spoke with the company that asked me to find the information. And uh, what they are doing in the background is contacting those facilities to tell them exactly what I was able to find within 45 minutes. Uh, because I should not be able to find that much in 45 minutes. And so they're taking care of what is called coordinated disclosure. 
So coordinating all of that information that I compiled securely to pass on to, say, the pharmaceutical companies uh, that are producing some of the vaccines, and then to say, listen, um, here are the problems, here's how uh, someone who's not very nice can get in, and here are the, some, some of the ways that you can actually fix this so that you don't have this exposure. And then making myself and the company uh, available for further questions. There is a lot of misunderstanding when it comes to uh, the technical world and the executive world. And not all executives are engineers or scientists, even in the medical industry. Uh, they are more geared towards profit and business. That's just what makes the world work. And because there is this gap of knowledge, they might not be able to recognize the risks, how it will affect them short term to long term, and then apply uh, whatever funds they need to, which includes hiring people. Now, at the same time, there are not enough people in cybersecurity right now to fill all of the jobs that are uh, being asked for. There's over two and a half million jobs worldwide in cybersecurity that are going unfilled as of today. So one of the reasons why I got into the Boeing story was because of my background as an air crew member and my studies in aeronautical engineering. And when I saw the uh, reports from Boeing in their comments saying that the Ethiopian Airlines pilots must have made various mistakes to cause the downing of the aircraft. Now, it might come as a surprise, but Ethiopian Airlines is one of the safest airlines in the world. And there were too many similarities between the Lion Air crash and the Ethiopian Airlines crash. So I decided to test a hypothesis to uh, see if I could find general bad coding practices because aircraft are gigantic computers that happen to fly. They're actually not aircraft as we used to know them back in history. Um, and that's one thing that a lot of airplane manufacturers, they don't understand that they're actually building Internet of Things devices uh, which just happened to be able to fly. So I ethically and legally went to take a look at Boeing's websites. And the first thing I noticed was there wasn't even any encryption. So we're used to seeing a little lock in, or a green bar in our internet websites, and this had none of it. And there were also login screens with no encryption. Now, Boeing is a primary target of uh, both industrial, industrial espionage and uh, country and nation state espionage. So imagine without that encryption, somebody logs in and their password can be sniffed. So then I looked further and I found what's called the aviation ID system. And with that system, an aircraft technician will download the software they need to be able to update the plane, because again, planes are computers. And the system was highly flawed with um, a lot of very basic uh, flaws in its web application coding. Um, and it was actually quite shocking that it was in that uh, situation. So then I looked a bit further and I was able to find a way in um, to all of Boeing's entire research and development systems. So I could see everything that was going on. And this not only poses a, a risk for, say, national security for multiple countries, because Boeing's also in the satellite industry as well. Um, but at the same time, let's say you're a shareholder and you have bought shares in a company, and that company is supposed to be worth X amount of money but you're not told that all of that uh, intellectual property behind that worth is, can freely float on the internet for anybody else to get and replicate. So uh, that's also a danger. Yes and no. They would have to also be able to understand what's going on inside the programming and also how to uh, modify and where to modify. So the short answer is, yeah, with enough skill and enough knowledge, absolutely. It's very interesting that a lot of organizations can learn a great deal of cybersecurity from the porn industry. 
And one of the reasons why is they have to protect their customers or the porn company, uh, say online, will go out of business very rapidly. Now we see a lot of different companies and organizations that they stay in business when all of their customer information is spilled out or used in some sort of extortion attack and they just keep going. That would not happen. Another thing that uh, the particular porn industry has done is they have done age verification first, which also helps with liquor sale and other different types of sales of uh, items where you have to be 18, 21, 16, whatever the country law might be. And also, um, they have to concentrate on privacy, which is something that so many organizations take for granted. Uh, most of us don't know where our da data is and uh, where uh, our most uh, sensitive and private information is. Uh, being held in what country, with what company, etc. But the porn industry keeps that all contained within the one um, particular organization. I don't think so. I think that if more and more business leaders, governments, and everyday people understand some of the risks and why it's important to secure all of our digital assets, to a level where we're comfortable with, then we shouldn't fear the future. The future is going to be fine. Um, there's always going to be something new that comes around. Uh, one of my uh, favorite songs from uh, hacker genre, a verse that I like to use is, you can't hide secrets from the future with math. You think you can try, but in the future they'll laugh at your half-assed schemes and algorithms and math to avoid cryptographic attack. So as time moves forward, uh, we have more computing power. We can do more with that computing power, good or bad. But I think more and more it is used for the good. So smart meters are very interesting because it's putting a piece of digital technology in your house. And currently, not all electric organizations know how to secure those properly. So if you have something that could be used for good or bad inside your house and you don't understand the risks and the electric companies don't understand the risks, then someone could use that to surveil to see when you're home and when you're not. Imagine uh, how much easier it would be for a burglar to use technology in that manner. And that's one of the reasons why the Netherlands is one of the few countries in the world where you actually have the right to refuse to have a smart meter installed in your home. Some of the dangers of smart meters can be uh, viruses, uh, also surveillance, and especially surveillance, because uh, we have to understand that privacy and security go together very well. And uh, privacy issues can lead to security issues and vice versa. And all of us, I think, want to maintain a certain level of privacy uh, in our lives. So one of the dangers that we have with lots of different uh, Internet of Things, IoT devices in our homes is um, in cases of domestic violence, uh, they have been used by the abusive partners. So suddenly you have no heat in your house because your abusive former partner has uh, accessed your Google Nest and turned off the heat or turned off the boiler in your house if it's internet enabled. They can also use that information that they get from those devices for when you're home and when you're not. And imagine an abusive person who wants to target you, how they can use this type of technology against you. So imagine if a government were able to turn the heat off of an entire country if a trade negotiation went bad. Now, something sort of similar happened in Eastern Europe when uh, particular countries were discussing gas pipelines and they shut off the heat and the gas for an entire country. But that was a bit more difficult and physical back then. Now you could just use an attack, very country specific, and try to take out as much of the heating IoT devices as possible to then try to sway those trade negotiations or much worse, imagine if it is the precursor for a war. 
Cyber warfare is a bit different from what we're used to. In a traditional war sense, there are troops on the ground, there are tanks, there are missiles, there are rockets, there's guns. And you have to move all of those troops to the place that you want to attack. And that means also feeding those troops, making sure they have fuel. And so you have to have a line of supplies. Now, with cyber warfare, you don't need that. You can, um, instead of having this line of supplies, zero in on the target that you want without anyone having to travel, without anyone having to go on a plane or get in a tank, or without any ammunition, you just use digital ammunition. And so it's much easier nowadays to execute those types of attacks. And we've seen it against, a uh, good example is the country of Georgia. Uh, when they were at war, uh, the enemy actually took out their satellite systems so that they could not visually see what was going on to see if the enemy actually wanted to roll tanks towards them. Or in the case of Aramco. Aramco, uh, up until 2020, was the world's most valuable company because it produced a lot of oil. But in 2012, uh, the Iranian uh, government decided to use cyber weaponry and digital bombs against Saudi Aramco and the Saudi country itself. And suddenly, the computers didn't work. 85% of the computers. It also knocked out two-thirds of the mobile telephone system. It also knocked out the internet system for much of the country. So imagine if you call up an ambulance and you say, hey, could you send an ambulance? Uh, my aunt is having a heart attack. And they say, well, we would love to, but um, the fuel system at Aramco, because it's also digital, was knocked out, so we don't have fuel to put into an ambulance to come to get you. So regular people couldn't even get uh, petrol in the country. It also spread to Bahrain, and then uh, the country of Qatar was hit. And within a two-week time period, uh, the world was facing um, the real danger of losing 39% of the world's energy market between natural gas and petrol and petrochemicals. That also would have halted uh, once uh, the gasoline and the oil could not be pumped out. What happens to our everyday devices or even in the medical field that we rely on petrochemicals and plastics? Think of IV bags, for example. And so just that one act of cyber warfare, there were no tanks, there were no missiles, there were no people or soldiers on the ground, but a digital weapon, a digital bomb went off in Saudi Arabia and could have caused a cataclysmic event around the world. My role in the Aramco attack was after they were attacked, and they were trying to get back up on their feet, uh, they had a lot of problems because the Iranian government then launched another series of attacks against them for more than three months. So I was contacted around that point in time uh, while I was coming back from vacation from Tanzania, and I was in an airport in Ist Istanbul, and I answered a call in roaming, and they said, hello, this is Aramco. We would like to hire you to reestablish our international business operations. I go, um, okay, thinking that this might not be a legitimate phone call. Uh, and then they asked me how much money I wanted, and I picked a number out of the air, and they said, we'll get back to you. And then they got back to me, and they said, we convened the board, which was at the time the world's most powerful board uh, in the world. They said, we've matched your offer and given you 20% extra. We want you to work for us. And I said, well, I'm starting a new job. And then they said, don't say no, say maybe. And then I double check because I do have a deeper voice. And I go by Chris. And I go, you do know I'm a lady, Chris. And they go, yes, 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 we definitely want you. Um, so I ended up working for them. And I ended up reestablishing all of their international business operations to fully get them restored so that they could operate around the world again and also help to uh, stabilize the oil market as well through my team's action and my actions. Very likely, 
Recently, we had something called the NotPetya attack, which um, was a piece of malware that uh, many of us believe got a bit out of control, uh, and it took out Maersk shipping in Denmark. And Maersk is a big cargo shipping company, and they own the majority of these ships. So suddenly, Maersk was not in operation at all. And that meant that uh, we had a real danger of food not being delivered. Uh, it's much more than, say, whatever you order online for Christmas or any other holiday. Um, imagine if you can't get food in the grocery store. And that's what we were facing. Uh, ports were halted. Even uh, the Rotterdam port was actually affected by not Petya and was down for a number of days. And it was only because there was one computer that had been disconnected from the internet and the network at Maersk in an African country that they were able to rebuild everything from that one computer system just by chance. So it could definitely happen here in Europe because it's already almost happened. One of the things that I've been pushing for uh, at the United Nations, uh, which I was asked to do a presentation in July of 2020, was instead of having an emergency response team for computers, also have a computer emergency prevention team. So look around and try to find the problems before they become uh, a big fire, because that's what the emergency teams, the response portion does, but don't you want to have a smoke alarm first and then be able to put out a tiny fire? And those recommendations were taken by the United Nations, where there's going to be a report uh, that will be updated listing those recommendations, because it's important how we get our water, how we get our electricity. All of that is done in a digital way nowadays. We want to make sure when we get a glass of water, it's good water, not bad water. And it's very easy um, with very, very skilled criminal nation state hackers nowadays to get into some of those uh, more vulnerable systems. I also believe that uh, governments should mandate that uh, critical infrastructure, the things that we depend on for a modern life, uh, have to adhere to higher uh, cybersecurity standards, but at the same time, they also have to financially support those organizations because we can't afford to pay 10 times the amount for water that we do right now uh, just to make sure that those systems are pretty well secured. So one of the joys about living in Amsterdam is the fact I don't own a car. I can have a bicycle and I can get around on public transport anywhere in the country. But the public transport, they are also digital devices, our trams, our buses, and our trains. And when we think about all of that, we have to also realize that if those organizations are not keeping them secure, that can be a very bad thing. But then you have your home. And some of us have digital locks with digital boilers and digital thermostats and lots of digital things like, uh, for instance, there might be one of those uh, Alexa devices uh, that can answer questions at any moment or your phone can answer a question at any moment. The problem is the microphones are always on on those devices. And um, there are still human beings listening in on those microphones. So you don't know if some of your private conversations or work conversations that could uh, lead to somebody selling that information uh, can occur and suddenly you don't have a job because somebody's undersold your company. Your company was depending on that. So we have to be aware of how uh, the digital technology around us can be used. Uh, we also have to be aware that uh, with our mobile phones, some people have older models that cannot be updated. And what happens is criminal attackers will use those older model mobile phones once they're connected to the internet and they will use them as attack tools. So en masse, they will go and exploit these phones and then suddenly your phone is being used in a spam attack or a, a distributed denial of service attack which could be against our water system or a tram system or a train system. 
uh, because our own uh, personal devices, unfortunately, can be weaponized and used against our own modern society. Some of the things we can learn from the physical world to the digital world when it comes to viruses is they're not all that dissimilar. One of the ways that we try to uh, minimize the damage that a virus can do is we do containment, uh, very much like our, our quarantine and our lockdowns. But typically, we try to contain in the areas that we know where it is versus contain everything and quarantine everything because it might not be everywhere. So once we find these areas, we uh, contain it while letting the rest of uh, the business or the information flow. We also work very rapidly at a vaccine and uh, use that vaccine uh, as quickly as possible. We also realize in the digital world that uh, the original malware can morph and change so that we also have to keep up with the different versions of that virus and keep applying the different types of vaccines, the versions for those different types of digital viruses. So there are a lot of similarities. Uh, we also try to take safeguards. Instead of, say, wearing a mask, in the digital world, you would say, have antivirus. Um, instead of, say, wash your hands in the physical world, will say, if you see warnings on your web browser that says this is insecure or could be malware, don't visit that website. So there are, again, a lot of similarities. Well, preparation and making sure that uh, all of the countries are included. For example, Taiwan has done an amazing job. They are not a member of WHO. And we are all one world. Uh, there also needs to be aspects of cybersecurity when it comes to the WHO because we've already seen uh, part of the supply chain of the vaccination for COVID being affected uh, by cyber criminals and nation states. Uh, so they also need to understand that when you set up things like uh, quick testing labs, not to connect everything to the internet. I was involved with uh, things like that in London with the first um, a uh, rapid testing center in London where it was extremely poor with cybersecurity, which meant the patient data could have gotten out. Um, we've already seen uh, recently in 2020, uh, Azerbaijan and Armenia got into a very short war. And with that, there were what we call um, patriotic hackers on the Armenian side was able to get into the healthcare database of Azerbaijan and get all of the test results, know who was positive, who was being watched, and was able to spill that on the internet. So there has to be an aspect of cybersecurity when it comes to healthcare, and especially when you have a pandemic, that information is very juicy. So the WHO needs a few more cybersecurity people. One of the reasons why there are not enough cybersecurity people to fill the jobs uh, that we have outstanding is because not enough women are in cybersecurity. The vast majority of ethical hackers, I believe there's only 8 to 10 percent of ethical hackers are women. And cybersecurity overall worldwide, there's only about 20 percent. Now to fill that gap, we need more women. We also need more diversity. And I'm inviting everyone that listens to me to check it out. You can come from any background. It is a very vast field, much like the medical field, where you might have an oncologist for cancer or a hematologist for blood. There are so many different things that you can do in cybersecurity to make our world uh, much more secure. But we need more women and more diversity to fill that gap. One of the places that you can start if you're interested in cybersecurity is in your own home or in your classroom. Check out some of the roles, see what type of education and skills it requires. Many times, uh, depending on the role, you can actually get in with an entry-level position where companies are so, so desperate for people. They will hire you, they'll put you through any sort of specialized training. 
There's also various government programs around the world that will actually fund for specialized training. And there are scholarships and internships available, especially right now to women and to minorities to do those internships from uh, big companies to small. And the governments around the world are funding it because we have such a desperate shortage. Oh, this has Very been nice. wonderful. And I feel so posh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, the lights are down. <laughs>